It's the Emma Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world. Welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Before we begin, I would like to thank you all for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. This episode is brought to you by BookBannersEtc.com and Willow Kestrel Jewelry. If you enjoy the show and would like to become a sponsor, you can by contacting me directly at emmett.blackwell at gmail.com. On this episode, I have Scottish mystery author C.A. Asprey. She has written three books of the Innocence Mystery series and is currently working on two more to add to her collection. She has a knack for taking real-life crime scenes and turning them into amazing complex crime fiction. At her core, C.A. is a tireless researcher who absorbs, processes, and creates incredible stories from what she discovers. We are very excited to have C.A. Asprey here today. And uh, C.A., how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So, now you're a Scottish mystery author who specializes in taking non-fictional crime stories and turns them into fictional stories. What are some of the crimes that you have had that have inspired your work? Yeah, uh, well, what I do, as as you say, I I base it on real crimes, but as they're a very popular genre, lots of people would be too familiar with the crimes if I just left them as they were. So what I then do is I will use them as perhaps a red herring or uh, I'll change the crime slightly to make sure that they're Anyone reading them is not really going to get any any clues as to who the murderer might be. I will alter them. They're, I use the real crimes as inspiration rather than just lift them in their entirety. Um, a couple of the crimes that I've used, for example, was um, the, in book one. Uh, there you'll see a lot of uh, bushwhackings and, and people passing through being being killed or going missing. Uh, that was based around the bloody benders who, in Kansas, of course, who really exist. And uh, the, as I say, as they're, they're so well known. I couldn't just leave things as they were. I had to d- make some changes in, in that scenario to give some surprise and an element of mystery to the book. Um, another one is uh, book three, for instance, is based around uh some of the cases of Joseph Bell. Dr. Joseph Bell was the man that uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote uh, Sherlock Holmes, Mm -hmm. he studied under him. And uh, his scientific method was used by the police in Edinburgh to solve a few murders. Uh, One of them was uh, a a murder of a woman who was unmarked and they didn't know how she was killing. And, of course, they had to bring him in to use a much more scientific and rigorous method to actually devise the murder method. And uh, for readers of the the Conan Doyle cases and the Joseph Bell cases as well. Again, they're they're quite well known, so I have changed that too. Yeah, wow, it's incredible. Now, you seem to add a little flair of humor to your writing. During your research on crime, I mean, it's got to be hard not to laugh at some of the stupid criminals out there. Now, how do you carry that same humor into your writing? Yeah, I I tend to write as a talk, to be honest. Um, I... Things I find funny I, I, in real life, I would say that I find them funny. Uh, I tend to use things that that happen in real life. Uh, people who work in the emergency services, police, nurses, ambulance, doctors, they, they are all very funny people. Mm-hmm. And they've all got a dark sense of humour. So I, tend, I do tend to use that um, whether or not those people are attracted to those jobs because they already have that sense of humour or whether they develop it is is up for debate. I think it's probably a bit of both. Mm -hmm. But, um, of course, then there are some very, very stupid criminals out there. (laughs) So it's it's quite fun to to make things not so menacing the whole time because real life is a mixture of light and dark all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quite good to, to... to give that that mix that you know you can go from um, some gory murder and then in the next scene somebody can be saying something funny, that's real life and that's 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 what people who solve murders in real life actually contend with. 
Wow. It's kind of incredible. <laughs> now, you have three books in the Innocence Mystery series. They all take place in the 19th century. Why did you choose that time frame? Yeah, um, I chose that time frame because that's when the, the real women who did the, the work for the Pink, Pinkerton Detective Agency actually worked and existed. What I've tried to do is not to base it on any autobiographical element, but rather created a character who does that job and who uses the early forensics and, and what have you that were available at the time. But of course, as those were the er earliest professional female detectives in the world, I had to set it in the time setting that, that they were in. Um, I became interested in the first female law enforcement in the world when I joined the police myself. Uh, the, the, women, the women who trained trained us. Uh, she, her name was June Lowe. She was a very funny woman, a clever and funny woman. And she used to regale us with tales from from far back and even the, the tales of, that the older older police officers had told her that went way, way back even pre to the war. Yeah. So th there were lots of funny stories that she used to tell, but it did get me interested in, in who the first police women were. And, and that was never taught. Nobody ever taught me that at school. Mm -hmm. Or, or even even in police college, it was just taken for granted that at some point when we became police officers. So as I looked further and further back, I did find that uh, surprisingly enough, it, it was the Pinkerton Detective Agency who were the first to employ them as fully fledged professional detectives. Yeah, I, I tell you, and, and that's another thing too, the, the whole dimension of this story is the fact that it's not just that you're throwing a female detective into a story, you've got so much history behind this that that really it's it's almost like a a rehashing of something that's happened in the past, and just people either have forgotten or not documented well, or not taught, like you said. So it, it is really incredible. Now I'm a huge fan of like ancient tech, okay, and I'm not talking like eight track tapes, okay. I'm talking like gramophones and typewriters. I love that kind of stuff. But your stories they have a different kind of tech and they incorporate it into the plot. What types of technology do you incorporate in your stories? Well, I used the, the technology that was around at the time. The 19th century was a, a hugely inventive time and uh, in, things were being invented and, and improved upon, but exponentially day to day, everything just moved on so much. It was a very fast moving time. Um, but, what I'd like to use is other things that were actually available. As you say, everything in the books is either historically accurate or historically possible. Mm -hmm. Not ne They're not necessarily both, because I may, may just take something that was available at the time and give it to somebody, as I say, who I've, I've created as a fictional character. But some of the text, the tech that I use are things like, well, the, the most obvious one is wiretapping. Uh, telegraphs, uh, they were invented a long time ago and these were strung across the country and as uh, right from the very beginning people have been s slinging a wire across that and tapping into it uh, to listen to various things during the american civil war wiretapping was used extensively by both times the both sides to try and find out about troop, troop movements and weapon movements and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Criminals have been using it to find out when payrolls were being delivered, <laughs> uh, to find out what, what time, what train they were coming on and things of that nature. And uh, then, of course, law, law enforcement. Well, Crippen's often cited as the first murderer who was caught by telegraph, but actually you go back further than that to 1845. And a man called John Towell was the first person who was it, actually... He poisoned his mistress with oh. prussic acid and then disappeared. Uh, the telegraph actually was caught him, made sure that he was caught coming off the train at the other end. And it, it was the the great, it was a, a cause celebre at the time. It was all over the country and, and it really added to the, the, the use of telegrams telegraphs and telegrams at that time because it, it drove home to the public how how quickly that could have done because be, before the telegram even if people saw him leaving the house as they did they would not be able to get anyone on that train aware of what was going on or get anyone to meet the train at the other end so he'd have just disappeared so yeah that was a huge 
step forward. Then, of course, that means that people use ciphers and codes. Mm -hmm. Um, they're as old as writing. They're, they're absolutely ancient, but there are many, many different types of codes. And of course, they were used. Uh, some of the, the some of the, the shorter ones are, are something like Playfair cipher, which generates just a short random phrase and then construct a grid, and that grid's used to, to just decode any message that you that you have. Uh, that's that's got its its limits because of the. The, the amount of times the letter E can be used. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I and J are interchangeable in that as well. So they, they, they're not too hard to to, to, to crack. Uh, then you've got stuff like the invisible inks, mm -hmm. and they, they can be made from anything. Onion juice is a popular one. I think we all played with that when we were a child. Mm -hmm. uh, semen was made, makes a very good invisible ink. Hmm. Uh, yeah, That's interesting uh, to know. <laughs> 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 of course, it does have its limitations for female female spies, but yeah, it's yeah. a very very it was a very popular uh, invisible ink that could be didn't he didn't uh, merit carrying anything around fruit juices, uh, milk even it, mm. it all they're all exposed by using a chemical or a process like heat to to expose the writing at a different rate to the paper or the fabric that it's written on. So they again they're a very old old one. One one of the ancient ones that goes back to Elizabethan times at the very least was still in use during World War Two and it's, it's it consists of using a mix of alum and vinegar and you write the message on a boiled egg which is not visible on the shell once it's dry, the, the, the eggs can then be put in amongst lots of raw eggs. Mm. And uh, then when you peel the, the eggshell away, the writing's on the alum inside. Now, you have to check every egg, egg individually to see which ones are boiled and unboiled, but you can you can tell a boiled, boiled egg and, and a, a raw one by spinning it on a, on a hard surface because they, they do different things to have a different movement. Wow. That, that takes a lot of ingenuity. I mean, it really does. Because, I mean, you think about it, I mean, it's almost as if we had hackers way back, way, way back, hacking the system, figuring out how, how to use it for their own benefit. Like you said, law enforcement using the uh, lines in order to uh, get messages through the telegra or telegraphs. I mean, it really is incredible. And that technology is just so pronounced in, in your books because you really kind of... You, you use it. Like, I mean, most of the people, they might write a mystery story and their detective has a magnifying glass and that's it. And that's all they, that's all they have. <laughs> but I mean, you've really done your research on this. So that, that's incredible. Um, yeah, you've, you've got to do your research because there's, there's so much out there that the things that you don't think would be available at that time, things like spy cameras, uh, they go right way back to the 1850s. And uh, the, the last one that was sold was one that was made by a woman, that were made for a woman. It was a woman's get watch, so it could be it could very well have been used by someone like one of the characters I've written. And the exposures by about the eighteen seventies, uh, they made by about the eighteen seventies exposure time was probably between one and two seconds. Mm. So the the idea that we have of them all standing for like ten minutes while it's exposed, that's really much, much, much earlier in the nineteenth century. And um, that progressed and changed quite quickly. And then there's stuff like um listening devices. Um, a, a man called John Toynbee invented an artificial eardrum back in 1852. And it basically was a long tube with a rubber disc in it that, uh, which basically acted like a, an artificial eardrum. It didn't take lo long before people realised that if you already did have decent hearing, you could use it to accentuate your hearing and listen through walls and doors. And then they, they also did things like uh, hide them in elaborate hairdos, hats, tiaras, things of that nature. And uh, the Victorians were very keen on making disability less visible Mm. That they, 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 to, to them it mattered that people looked normal so when they needed some extra help they, they did things like hide hearing aids and tiaras and hairdos and, thing, and hats and even glasses so that was very useful to the spies to use these things to listen in Wow that is that's that's just so amazing to me. Now, what we'll do is we'll take a look at uh, the characters that you have in your book after this message from our sponsor have you ever found yourself looking for a gift but just can't find something that's unique and different? 
There are many online shops to find jewelry, but most of those sites carry manufactured creations that are mass-produced. The internet is at your fingertips. You shouldn't have to travel through all the realms to get something amazing. At Willow Kestrel Jewelry, you will find handcrafted creations. Whether you are looking for wire-wrapped pendant, natural shells, or beautiful precious gemstones, you will find it all at Willow Kestrel Jewelry Shop at Etsy.com. Willow Kessel Jewelry uses genuine gemstones, including amethyst, moonstone, citrine, rose quartz, laramar, malachite, sapphire, and many more. You can make it rain with gemstones. I know I did. And it felt like I had been transported back in time to when me and my friend had to take a ring back to a mountainous volcano and toss it in to save the world. Now you can use the coupon code BLACKWELL20, that's Blackwell, with the number 20, to save 20% at checkout. Search Willow Kessel Jewelry under Shops at Etsy.com today. In a world full of obstacles and haphazard graphics, one company has broken the mold of building amazing book covers, banners, video trailers, and more. Book Banners Etc. is your premier source for the most epic designs. Constructed from the mind of independent author Lynn Lamb, Book Banners Etc. is dedicated to making your dream a reality. They offer an array of marketing materials at affordable prices. If you're looking for book covers that pop, Banners that captivate, swag for signing, and alluring video trailers stop by www.bookbannersetc.com. That's bookbannersetc.com. Imagine your world, then make it epic with www.bookbannersetc.com. All right, we are back. Now, your series follows <clears throat> the cases of Pinkerton detective Abigail McKay. Yes. Well, it's actually pronounced Mackay it, by Scottish people. Oh, so it's a it's Scottish what, thing. <laughs> is it, it's, yeah, well, the, as it's explained in the book, it's it's not an English name and it doesn't follow English rules. The Gaelic alphabet only has uh, 23, 23 let, uh, letters and it. it doesn't have the same number of letters as the English alphabet. So the, the, the sounds, the letters did make different sounds. And when they're joined together, they make different sounds than they would in English. So there's quite a lot of Scottish names aren't pronounced the way you hear them in the media. And that's one of the reasons I used it, used that name, <laughs> because it gives the comedy value that it can give, that you can get out of people not being able to pronounce your name. Uh, when I worked when I worked in the States, I I had that constantly. My name, my maiden name is not Mackay, but again, it was another name that nobody could pronounce. And uh, I just thought, you, they say, write what you know, so I used that. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's just so funny because, I mean, uh, this is obviously, I'm an American and I'm obviously messing this up again. But, <laughs> all right. But, I mean, you know, the funny thing is, is that it's a rather unique character. I mean, like I said before, she's a female lead in the 19th century. And you said there's history behind this, which is even more incredible. Um, I think that I'm probably like everybody out there who's listening and at first did not know any of that information. But then you throw in the fact that she's a master of disguise. And that's incredible to me because most of the time you see a detective story or you see a detective book or a detective movie and it's usually the male who who is ready to uh, dress up in all different things but you have a female lead and i mean what helped inspire abigail yeah uh what helped inspire her was the the women i worked with mm. uh, and i I basically, we were amongst the first to do exactly the same job as men in the UK. And it, it basically struck me that the things that we went through and the sexism we experienced and the walls that we came up against would have been very much the same mm -hmm. as the ones she would have met. So I, I based it on the type of women who were attracted to that that type of work. And uh, some of them were very, very feminine, very attractive but they were all clever, smart, determined, and not one of them saw themselves as a sidekick or as any lesser than the male officers. They saw themselves as just as much a police officer as any man in that station, and that's the way I made her. Mm. Um, the fact that she is a master of disguise, that's based around two pieces of, of research. Is one, that's be, they, they did go in undercover. That was their main role for the Pinkertons. So, of course, that meant adopting different accents and different disguises. Uh, it's also based on the fact that the lighting around that period in, in 
improved things in theatres to an unbelievable degree. So instead of just having limelight, and that's mm-hmm. where the that's where the saying comes, but being in the limelight, mm-hmm. which casts cast, cast a, a very strange light on the stage, that's what they used before, and candles and things like that, then all of a sudden they could see really clearly mm-hmm. what was on the stage. So makeup had to improve, and over that period, the makeup improved exponentially. Leichner was amongst the first and he created grease paint. There were classes for people to to mix these grease paints themselves to make themselves look very much more realistically whatever character they they wanted to play. Winks became better um, and they did a lot of research. The, The main research that, that took me a lot lot of time was the fact that the the only known character the only known photograph of the very first female Pinkerton detective she's dressed as a man hmm. and she was said to have uh, long chestnut hair but in the wig she's wearing she's got short blonde hair but in the po- photograph she's got short blonde hair so she's clearly wearing a wig and it was like I was like well, where where would all that long Victorian hair go can you get that all under a wig and uh, that took me a lot of time to to find out but eventually I did manage to find uh, not only that you can but a, vi- a video on how to do it um, it was cos- cosplay and the live action type things where a lot of girls out in the far east and in India with their long long very thick hair managing to get it all under a short rig so yes that and it might sound strange to you that I, I felt that was something I had to research but it just I, I couldn't I've got very thick hair and I couldn't envisage getting if, getting it any length of it under a short rig but so I, I needed to know that what I was writing was accurate. So I had to work on that until I found out that it either was or it wasn't. Yeah. And, and you know, it almost, it, it helps you connect to your characters a little bit. You know, mm. I mean, all that research, the the trying things out, the, the fact that you've been on this journey writing this story and, you know, you've been involved in finding out how they live their lives. I mean, that's that's perfect examples of how to get into your character, how to how to understand where they're coming from. And, and you do an excellent job with that. Thank you. <laughs> So now you Thank also you. have two other very complex characters, uh, mm-hmm. Nat Quinn and Jake Conroy, who seem to be in the path of Abigail's cases. They are just simple robbers, but they usually get caught up in solving another crime that goes deeper than a simple train robbery. What helped inspire these guys? Also, uh, what is going on with the romance between Nat and Detective Abigail? Yeah, well... I think most writers throw in a romance or something of that that type in, in a book, and you need conflict. And I thought, what gives a bit greater conflict than a, a romance between two people on different sides of the law? <laughs> yeah. And and again, I've, I've made them very very similar characters, but on on different sides. They both. He's also very intelligent and quite highly skilled. He's interested in all the science of the time, but he uses it to break break into places and to break the law where she uses it to solve it. So I've made them two sides of the same coin, if you like. Um, of course, they're, 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 they're drawn to one another. The, the criminality gave it a good conflict. And the reason I set the first one in Wyoming was because uh, Wyoming Territory and then later, later Wyoming State, they, there's no statute of limitations there. So it wouldn't matter how long he waited. He could be in his 60s, 70s, and they'd still be wanted. So I needed that conflict uh, for the character and, and that, that pressure for the character so that there wasn't as simple as just running away, living a quiet life, and, and then being able to carry on with life as normal. I needed something a bit more complex than mm-hmm. that for him. Uh, the Jake character, he's he's quite handy because I think it's it's good to have a sidekick that I, I think that they're very often used sidekicks to explain things to the, the readers. Mm, yeah. So that that's that's his function primarily. <laughs> um, but uh, he has his own different skills as well that, that I can, it, it just gives me a whole different skill set that I can throw into people. But I've, uh, that's his original function was to explain things to the readers without uh, having to live too much inside a character's head. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's such a diverse 
group of people that you've picked to put into this story because I mean, like, like I said, the humor is there, you know, you've got, uh, it's just crazy. It really is. And it's such a, it's such a slice of, of, uh, what people would be like at that time. You know what I'm saying? And then at the same time, like I've told other authors, it's funny because the characteristics that these people have in historical fiction really plays in what is already happening today. And it's just funny. People are always the same. They'll always do the same kind of stuff. And, yeah. uh, but it, but it, I, don't think, I don't think people do change. I think times change, but people don't. They yeah. just react to what's going on around about them <laughs> no matter what times, times you set them in. And yeah, I mean, you could have. I nice you say that. Yeah, I mean, you could have put um, a Nat on a Harley Davidson with a leather jacket, and you know, Abigail still would have went for that guy. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's a bad boy, but he's he's not he's not that bad, and he's he is also very clever. He <laughs> he took some wrong turns in life, and uh, also his uncle gave me some. T- it gave me ways of exploring the history and putting some um, early PTSD in there because his mm. uncle's got PTSD. Um, his uncle, the backstory is that his, his uncle brought him up from a very young age because of, of they were orphaned and rioting against the Irish, uh, which, of course, they were Irish immigrants and they were orphaned in that. And that affected their life. That changed their life and, and robbed them of many chances. And that's how they drifted into a life of crime, which is gives them a different perspective than somebody who would have been a criminal no matter what had happened to them in life. Wow. In your most recent Innocence book, Innocent Bystander, you bring in a new character that completely contrasts Abigail, and I'm talking about her sister Madeline. Um, yeah. She, yeah, she, <laughs> she runs off with a widower who, why, whose wives have mysteriously died, leaving a large deal of money behind. And then she goes missing. And this launches a case that becomes very personal for Abigail. And then, and this is the greatest part about your writing, all right? And then to add to the complexity of the story, she has to call upon Nat, who is in jail, to help solve the case. Now, this seems to be the most complex of your books. What helped build this case? Um, well, this is the one that's that's based on originally on the germ of an idea that grew from the one of the Joseph Bell cases, but um, it just seemed to me that Abigail was getting too clever and mm. she needed to come up against somebody even cleverer than her, and I had to give her something really difficult to do. So that that's why I gave her a, a proper scientist to contend with mm. and science that was beyond her her teaching. Um, then again, I, I also thought that she and Nat were getting a bit close, so I thought I'd throw in a <laughs> a, a nightmare sister to to give them some to give them something else to work on. <laughs> um, and although she's our, she's Abigail's sister, they they are different personalities, but they do share that that what we call in Scotland thrown um, <laughs> that that obstinate stubborn stubbornness that, that that will to go your own way they they, they share that but they, they do it in very different directions wow. um <laughs> and then uh, then of course i threw in uh tibby who appears in the first book who's mm. who's a journalist just to confuse things further uh who's a journalist and uh the, the jun- journalism at the time the phrase yellow journalism didn't come in until later but the the, the practices of of uh, dirty journalism and, and doing underhand things basically doing anything you can to get a story mm. uh, that that i thought that was too good not to have in there and of course a journalist is always a danger to someone who's who's hiding from the law oh yeah but they're also a danger to a case because they're they're, they're quite likely to spill the beans on something that you don't want the criminals to know yet. So I thought it added another dimension. Oh, yeah. And of course, I, I made him totally amoral, and, and uh, he's, he's, he's a lord of misrule. He's, he's, I, I had a lot of fun writing him. Wow. It really, I mean, that's, a, that's the best part about your writing is that it is so complex. And, I mean, people out there who are listening, right, check out the Innocence Mystery Series is complex. And if, if you're one of those people who like word puzzles and people who solve crimes in a very clever way, I mean, I'm not talking like, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I love Sherlock Holmes, but the problem with Sherlock Holmes is it's almost as if you can just kind of rely on Sherlock to solve the mystery. When you read one of the innocence mystery books, 
Okay, you actually get engrossed in the story. You are just solving the mystery just like Abigail, and you're right along with her. So um, I want to commend you, CA, for doing that. It, it's an amazing story. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, and my, I must add that I do follow the, the, the one of the rules of mystery writing is that all the clues do need to be in the book, and it mm-hmm. has to be possible for the reader to to, to, to find out who the murderer is. Uh, that's if they can sort through all the red herrings and misdirection and, and things like that as well. But it is possible to identify. I've made sure that all the clues are in there, if you can spot them. Oh, that's good. That's very good. <laughs> So now, what do you have planned for the next book? Will it be part of the Innocence Mystery series? Yeah, um, I'm, I've written book four, which I'm resting at the moment, and I'm about halfway through book five. Book four is uh, basically it's it's a tr- it's what they call a, a bottle book. Um, mm. I think they use that term where there is, people are all bottled up, and yeah, so they they can't really get away, and it's it's got to be amongst a certain group of people. But it's it's a, a land a landslide that, that stops a train. Uh, but that train happens to be full of butlers. <laughs> butlers? <laughs> yeah, English butlers who, and they actually did do this uh, because as the, the nouveau riche grew up in the in, in the USA and out in San Francisco and places like that, they wanted all the class that the, the English nobility had, so they bought in lots of their butlers. So this is a, a basically a... a an agency who are transporting their butlers out to give all these nouveau riche people out in the West a touch of the the, the old world class that they're, they're looking for. And uh, so that's what all these butlers are doing on there. <laughs> of course there's a murder. Of course <laughs> oh, there's, yeah. of course there's a, a missing moon, moonstone. And there's, uh, there's a big bag of cash and there's also a kangaroo as well. So oh, I like huh? to produce some of the unexpected in my books. <laughs> So then, like, I mean, I mean, I don't want to ruin the story, but then, like, that whole term, the butler did it. I mean, you can, it's, you got to narrow this down, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's I thought. I thought you've got to do one where every all the suspects are butlers. And how else was I going to do that than a, that than an agency that employed butlers? But <laughs> that is perfect. Convenient, conveniently, historically, there were lots of uh, English serving staff. You did go to the, the states and travel to go to work for the, all the nouveau riche. And uh, San Francisco itself was a quite a magnet for them because they had quite a lot of rich people there up in Nob Hill, or as it was being built, the the the, the, the houses that were built lower down, and then they abandoned for Nob, Nob Hill. Wow, that I I really like that concept. It's such a unique idea. So now you've been writing this series for a while, and your stories get more complex. They get more intriguing, and your fans love it. They they like the fact that you can write a complex mystery story, which doesn't happen very often nowadays. Um, what advice would you give a new author who is just getting started? Um, I would say take all the feedback that you're given, but take it under advisement. There may be some things that you don't agree with. As you see, my books are quite complex, and it was fed back to me by a fairly well-known author, actually, that I should make them a lot more simple. But I just thought, no, that's not what I want to write. You have to have confidence in your own voice and what it is you want to write. You can listen to it and think, does that add to my writing? There are plenty of things I've done where it doesn't add, didn't add to my writing, um, and I dismiss those. There are other things where I think, no, I don't, I don't agree with you. Uh, So I'll, I'll take, I'll take things on board. They've certainly shaped. a lot of points for me and made me a better writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, as you said, the books develop as they go on because that was my first ever book was the first one. And I think I've, le- I've been learning my craft as I go along and uh, other writers have been invaluable for that. And I think when people give you advice or in good good faith, then by all means listen to it. But also have faith in that, that little voice inside you to say, "Is I don't want them to change how I want to write. I don't want them to change my voice. I just want them to help me polish the work. Mm. That's good. I really like that. Now, where can people find your books? Yeah, well, the, I'm only on Amazon. Uh, so you'll find that on Amazon. Uh, that's C-A Asprey, A-S-B-R-E-Y. And uh, you'll find them, the the 
sold under the Innocence Mystery series, and uh, you'll find them all over the world. Wow. And there are quite a few places there, free and Kindle Unlimited as well. So for people who are looking for something post-Christmas, who maybe their pockets are a bit roped out, so that might be Kindle, that might be quite good for them. Yeah, and this is the best time of the year, guys, especially if, you know, I mean, it's it's like the middle of January right now, almost the end of January, um, to pick up a good book series and kind of wade your way through the rest of the winter. And then that way, you know, it, it's something great to read. And, and when you get intrigued on it, I mean, it is incredible. So... Um, now, CA, we have hit the point of the show where I am going to put you through a quiz segment, if you're ready. Okay. And let me just tell you a little bit about this quiz, because it's a little bit different than what we normally do. Now, seeing is how you are a detective mystery author, and you're, you're used to asking questions in your profession. And what I'm going to do is you're going to ask me 20 questions, and you need to solve a mystery. Now, you have the murderer, that's me, and you just need – not really. This is just a game, folks. Okay. <laughs> um, now, um, I need to confess to you what the – crime weapon was. So what you need to do is you need to ask me 20 questions. It can be any 20 questions, but here's the kicker. I can only answer yes or no, and um, it will be something that existed in the 19th century, so it won't be like a ray gun or anything like that. So are you ready? Yep. Let's go for it. All right. Go ahead. Right. Does the weapon leave a wound on the body? Yes. Is the... Wind penetrating? Yes. And and it'll be there later. Right. Yep. Does the did the wind penetrate the entire body? Did it go through one side through to the other? Yes. Does the Does the weapon have blade a blade? No. Is the weapon a projectile? Um, part of the weapon is a projectile. The other part is stationary. So it's a gun. Oh, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Leave it to an American to pick a gun, right? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Yes, oh, correct. Wow, I'm you did, did. I'm just glad you did pick something like an icicle or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it melts when it gets to the victim. No, that yeah. would be too clever. Uh, but <laughs> I'd be one of those stupid criminals. That's why I don't commit crimes. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for being here on the show. It was an excellent experience. Thank you. Thank you. It's been lovely to speak to you. And uh, I hope that everybody has a chance to read the books and enjoy them for themselves. Yes, yes. And they are incredible, folks. I'm telling you, they're really good. So, CA, it was wonderful having you on. Um, I can't wait to see what you got coming out next. It's been incredible. Um, I look forward to reading more of your writing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emmett. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. It's the Emma Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world. <laughs>